Starting now the, uh, the, the uh, lecture. We are in Senior English B. You should be in your hymnals at page 858. We're looking at number 10 now together. We'll do three things this hour. One, we're going to look at this question. Two, we're going to look at the passage known as defensive poetry. Three, we'll begin the process of outlining this by starting with Shelley's text, Nightingale, since that's the one of the, of the three offerings of Shelley that we've not yet looked at. All right, you ought to have paper in front of you for some notes. You might want to call this the writing assessment of packet number uh, uh, five. That is due on Monday. And we're working with page 858, number 10 is the question. In defense of poetry, the previous page, Shelley wrote that, quote, Poetry turns all things to loveliness. It exalts the beauty of that which is most beautiful, and it adds beauty to that which is most deformed, end quote. In what ways is this comment reflected in the poems you read? And please explain. Now, Mr. Brown, what I want to do with this kind of a question is I want to first look at the issue of defense of poetry. Okay, we need to get, we got to make sure we know what defense of poetry is saying. Then we want to pay particular attention to this line, and then we want to apply it to three texts of Shelley's, correct? We want to look at all three of the poems that we have of Shelley's. What are they? Ozymandias, West Wind, and Skylark. Okay, so we got three offerings of Shelley. So it's fairly easy, Mr. Ramos, to kind of think about the way we're going to outline this essay that we've got to write. Our three points of validation are obviously going to treat those three texts, right? But before we go to that, let's now look on page 857 and defense of poetry. Let's get ready to take a few notes, either on that blank sheet of paper or if you have annotations over defense of poetry already, we're doing some in-class annotative work. Shelley wrote a defense of poetry after reading a composition, an, uh, another essay in which a friend and fellow poet jokingly claimed that poetry no longer had a place in society. You can see I'm reading right off of your hymnal at page 857 at the top, aren't I? Right? Uh, because it seemed to Shelley that this view was in fact becoming widely held, he made a passionate argument for the value of poets in poetry. So let's now summarize. Shelley reads an essay where someone says poetry is dead. Poetry is dead. It's of no value anymore. And poets are of no value. Okay? Shelley, who is a poet, was so upset by this view that he decides to write a defense of poetry. It's a long essay. We're only looking at a brief part of it on page 857. Let's take a look at what he says about you know, I love, this, I love this little passage because it answers the question, why should we even look at this junk anyway, this stupid poetry crap? This is the answer Shelley's going to give. Let's take a look at it. He says, poetry is indeed something divine. It is at once the center and circumference of knowledge. Poetry is not like reasoning, a power to be exerted according to the determination of the will. A man cannot say... I will compose poetry. Sorry, Mr. Rothlutner, but I know that's exactly what we expect you to do when we're working with young authors' poems, right? Today I'm going to sit down and write a poem. Shelley's going to make an interesting distinction. There's a difference between writing a poem and being a poet. There's a difference between playing music and being a musician. Hmm. Jot down in your notes. What distinction are we making here? There's a difference between writing a poem and being a poet. A difference between playing music and being a musician. A difference between painting a picture and being an artist. We could continue this. A difference between working on an engine and being a mechanic. A difference between welding something and being a welder. What distinction are we making here in your notes? Cruz Nicholas, what distinction are we making? 
Right. This is a big part of it. It has to do with your passion, doesn't it? It has to do with your drive, right? But let's point out as well that what Shelley is saying here is that poets are not made. They are born. They are special people who see the world in very special ways. Notice, a man cannot say, I will compose poetry. The greatest poet even cannot say it. For the mind in creation is as a fading coal, which some invisible influence, like an inconstant wind, awakens to transitory brightness. This power arises from within like the color of a flower, which fades and changes as it is developed. And the conscious portions of our natures are unprophetic, either of its approach or its departure. I'm always interested to hang out with artists. So, for example, I will, I will take a work of art, for example. And I will say, okay, now this work of art started on all completely white canvas, right? So at one point, that canvas was completely white, right? But now there's no white on it other than what was placed there by the artist, right? Question, why that? Like, what made you know where to start? I love to ask questions to artists like this. And they'll give, you me, they'll give me a look like, I don't, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't really think about the process. No, I'm interested. Like, where did you start when you started to create this, comp this composition? Like, what, did you start in the middle of the canvas? Did you start at one of the corners? And why start with the color of ink that you started with? Or we could go on with a number of these why, why, why process questions. Artists will often look at me like, you don't get it. I, I didn't look at the canvas and know what it was going to look like at the end. Really? No, no, you just start working and a product comes. Now the next question, and this is Shelley's insight. Where does the idea come from? And it's at this point most artists will look at me and say, you know, I, 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 I can't answer that. I don't know, dude. It was just like something inside of me just said, this is what I'm going to do. And then I started doing it. And while I'm creating, I'm at the same time discovering. And it's to that degree, that's what makes it enjoyable. But let's point out something about artists. And this is disturbing. And if any of you are artists, uh, allow me to apologize in advance. This is what Shelley says, too. If that kind of insight just comes almost spontaneously, bubbling up out of you, how much longer do you have that capacity? Like, do you have that capacity for the rest of your life? Or do you wake up some morning and look at a canvas if you're a painter, and there's nothing there that inspires you to put paint on the canvas? And then it goes away. Shelley's word picture is that inspiration is like a coal that's dying. It's like an ember that's dying. So in other words, while the ember is on fire, you have some kind of creation possible. When it goes away, it's done. Well, now that's a scary way to think about art if you're an artist. Why? Why is that scary if you're an artist? <clears throat> And I've had this conversation with artists. Why? Because if art isn't enjoyable to an artist, what is? Yeah. Once, for example, an artist looks at a piece of cloth and can't come to any kind of sense of what to do with it, I mean, she could make it up, right? I mean, she could like, but that isn't, see, an artist knows. That's not the same thing as being an artist, just painting a picture, right? It's the inspiration. And Shelley says, that's why poets are so important because they do something really important within a society. Well, what specifically does poetry do? Look at the second paragraph. And again, you can see those ellipses there. That means that this essay goes on for much longer. Let's take a look. Poetry turns all things to loveliness. <laughs> this is, by the way, the lines I think we'll be working on, correct? Mm -hmm. It exalts, that means raises, the beauty of that which is most beautiful. And it adds beauty to that which is most deformed or ugly. Now put it in your own words right now. What is it he just said about what poetry does? He says it does two things. It takes beautiful things and it makes them what? More beautiful. Yeah, more beautiful. It exalts them. It even makes them more remarkable. But what about stuff that's ugly? What does poetry do? Right. It takes stuff that's ugly or deformed, and it somehow makes you look at it different as well. Hmm. 
Now we're going to ask, does Shelley's poetry do this at all and in what way does it do it? Keep going though. It marries, that means it brings together exultation and horror, two opposite emotions. It brings together grief and pleasure. It brings together eternity and change. It subdues to union under its light yoke all irreconcilable things. Let's put it in your notes this way. Poetry, and by extension, by the way, we might say all great art does this. Poetry makes opposites somehow understandable. Mr. Nelson, let me give you an example. Years ago, one of my students was a, a photographer. He remains so. And uh, he put together a, a work of art. Uh, uh, one of the images that he had was the image that was taken when the Allied troops came through and emancipated some of those terrible death camps in Germany, Auschwitz. And there was a pile of dead body corpses there, hands sticking out, feet, a face half gone. Brutal, brutal pictures. And the student had taken that image and then above it had simply written the word love. And this was his work of art. We think of that moment as evidence of hate. We don't think of it as evidence of love, right? And the poet, artist, pointed out that in his mind, the individuals that did that to those people had to have been in love with something. But what? For example, we know that as parents, they love their children, those guards of those terrible camps. They had husbands, or they had wives, and they loved them. In other words, what poetry does is it makes you look at opposites and somehow try to come to terms with them. That is to say, it helps you see the world differently. For Shelley, are you ready for this? For Shelley, that's the most important thing in the world. For Shelley. That's why poets are so important. And that's why reading poetry is so important. Because if you can't do that, your soul dies. And once your soul dies, what's the point of being alive, Shelley will ask. What's the point of it all? Keep going with me to finish this little passage. It transmutes, that means it changes. All that it touches in every form moving within the radiance of its presence is changed by wondrous sympathy to an incarnation of the spirit which it breathes. Its secret alchemy, chemistry turns to potable gold the poisonous waters which flow from death through life. It strips the veil of familiarity from the world and lays bare the naked and sleeping beauty which is the spirit of its forms. It makes you look at the stuff you always see differently. So for example, I've had students that say, after a close reading of Ode to the West Wind, I think about the wind a little bit differently. After the request at the end of Ode to the West Wind that his words be taken across the universe, I kind of think differently about what it is when I read a poem. Here was this cat sitting there all alone, writing in his little journal. I hope someday people will read this and it will make them think differently. He calls the poem Ode to the West Wind. He goes out on a boat and he drowns. The passage publishes... And then many, many years later, you end up reading it. So now we're going to drown? I would say drown in what? He noticed his word picture isn't hope that readers drown, but I hope that they what? Flourish. Awaken. Yeah. Awaken. Let's take a look at now. We'll, we'll move now to the second part. Let's take a look now at the way in which Shelley actually tries to accomplish what we just read. A bird is a bird is a bird, right? Well, not to Shelley. So let's take a look at it now to a skylark. The thing that makes a skylark so famous is, of course, its ability to sing. And we'll call this an ode, even though it's not in its title. We'll call this an apostrophe. A poet writing specifically, directly to a bird. I've got a number of questions, by the way, on the exam over this passage, so that's why we're working with it now as well. Hail to thee, blithe spirit. 
Now, some of us are familiar in the mornings with waking up to the song of birds. Some of us don't like it because these birds can wake us up quite, quite early. Um, two different times, I'll say this, Mr. Lang, uh, two different times in my teaching of this poem, no kidding, two different times uh, I've been working with this poem. This happened the last time four years ago. I was actually reading this poem right about this time of the year. A bird came and sat in Ruthie's tree and started singing so loud, Mr. Brown, that I literally had to stop reading. I mean, he was really, really loud. He was kind of reverberating. He was sitting right there. And, it, uh, and, and the first time this happened to me, it kind of freaked out my students because I just kind of looked at the bird and said, all right, all right, instead of reading about it, we'll listen to it. And we just waited for this bird, and he just kept singing. Um, and then I kind of mentioned this a couple of years after that happened, and then ironically it happened to me again. I don't know if it'll happen this time again as we read this poem. But it was kind of an interesting, it was kind of an interesting moment when a bird uh, uh, came and sat in Ruthie's tree and just started singing. Of course, within the courtyard, it reverberates, doesn't it, right, really loud. Shelley is going to write about a bird, and he's going to move from the simple to the complex. I would write this down. He's going to move from the simple to the complex. By that we mean he's going to start out by just describing the stupid bird, but by the time he finishes, this bird is going to be challenging him to think about life differently, and by extension, maybe you think of it differently. Some students have said, after I understand this poem, I never really think about the song of a bird the same way. For example, if I were to ask any of you to start singing, and really kind of loud, you could actually, the human voice, you could actually only do it for a short period of time. How do you account for the fact that a little tiny creature can project from that little tiny uh, throat the song that it sings for a long time and birds never seem to get hoarse, their throat? Question two, if I see you singing, I'm going to assume there's some reason for that singing even if it's nothing more than I'm just feeling happy. Emotion. Birds sing every morning. Why? Are they happy? I mean, really, do we think of birds in this way? See, this is going to be the question that Shelley will ask. And all of a sudden now, the song of a bird can take on a different view. We're back to defensive poetry and the way poets can make the normal seem kind of unusual. Let's take a look at it. I'll just read this poem. Your job is to try to figure out what it is that he says about the bird in each stanza. By the way, if you do that, if you know that, you'll, you'll kill the test questions. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird, thou never wert that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest like a cloud of fire. The blue deep thou wingest and singing still dost soar and soaring ever singest. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, o'er which clouds are brightening, thou dost float and run like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun. The pale purple even melts around thy flight like a star of heaven in the broad daylight. Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. Keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere, whose intense lamp narrows in the white dawn clear until we hardly see we feel that it is there. All the earth and air with thy voice is loud as when night is bare. From one lonely cloud the moon rains out her beams and heaven is overflowed. What thou art, we know not. What is most like thee? From rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see as from thy presence showers a rain of melody. Like a poet hidden in the light of thought, singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought to sympathy with hopes and fears it heeded not. Like a high-born maiden in a palace tower, soothing her love-laden soul in secret hour with music sweet as love which overflows her bower. Like a glowworm golden in a dell of dew, scattering unbeholden its aerial hue among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view. Like a rose, Embowered in its own green leaves, by warm winds deflowered, till the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet those heavy-winged thieves. Sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass, rain-awakened flowers, that all, all that ever was joyous and clear and fresh, 
thy music doth surpass. Teach us, sprite or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine. I have never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. Chorus hymnal or triumphal chant matched with thine would be all but an empty vaunt, a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. What objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind? What ignorance of pain? With thy clear keen joyance, languor cannot be. Shadow of annoyance never came near thee. Thou lovest, but never knew love's sad satiety. Waking or asleep, thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream, or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream? We look before and after, we pine for what is not, our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught, our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, if we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. Better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow, the world should listen then as I am listening now. Now let's point out, Shelley plays an interesting game. He calls on an experience that all of us have had listening to the song of a bird. M most of us have never even thought to ask, why would a bird even sing? And why does its throat never get tired? And what is it singing about? See, we don't think about questions. You've got to leave it to a poet to ask a question like that. Notice the attempt on page 854 to derive a number of similes. Uh-oh, we're at 2B, aren't we? a number of similes to talk about what this bird is. What is a simile again? Jot it down at 2B in your notes. Do you remember what a simile is? We're playing the game of comparison, right? There's two ways to play that game. One way is simile. What is that? A comparison where we use like or as. So we're comparing the bird. It's kind of like this. It's like that. That's a simile. The other kind of comparison is what? When we go right to the heart of the matter and we don't use like or as, what do we call that? That is a metaphor, right? That is a metaphor. Notice that he's going to play the game of the simile. Starting on page 854, he will try to, he'll try to figure out what is a bird. Start with me, for example, at roughly line 31 or so, okay? What art thou, or what thou art, we know not. What is most like thee? So that's where he starts. What's most like a bird singing? And then he comes up with a series of these similes. By the way, you want to write them down quickly in your notes, all right? What are these similes that we know are, are, are the uh, 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 ways that he's trying to understand a bird? Re work through them, because all, you're going to have several of these on your exam. Notice the first one. He's like a what? No, start, start with the, um, start with the uh, it, go in the order that we're actually working with. So I'm working now on starting on page 31. What is most like thee? From rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see as from thy presence showers a rain of melody. So what's the first kind of comparison? A song of a bird is like a what? Raindrops. Right? And of course, Shelley will be a contemporary of what poet? Who wrote about a rainbow? Words, words. You're right. And what did that poem say? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Wordsworth could have said, I sing like a skylark when I behold a rainbow in the sky. And it's the same game, right? So in other words, a, a rainbow, look at the next one, like a poet hidden in the light of thought, singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought to sympathy with hopes and fears that he did not. Poets write the words that make the world think about the world differently. Right? Look at the next one. Like a high-born maiden in a palace tower. Uh oh, what's this about? Soothing her love-laden soul in secret hour with music, sweet as love. 
which overflows her bower. Write that one down in your own words. What's this one? What's this simile? A bird its song is like a beautiful woman way up high in a tower all alone. What's that? What, what do we think of? We, 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 we do. We think of some of, those, some of those stories, don't we? We think of Sleeping Beauty or Rapunzel or some of those kinds of stories. The woman who is kind of sad for her lover sitting all alone up in the tower. Look at the next one. Like a glowworm, golden in the dell of dew, scattering unbeholden its aerial hue among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view. Um, this this um, firefly is, is the way we would think of it. By extension, you can also think of it as almost like a butterfly, right? Look at the next one. Like a rose, right? A beautiful rose that, by the way, you can also smell. Put a note to yourself. Shelly elicits or plays the game of all five senses in this poem. What can you see? What can you taste? What can you touch? In this case, what can you smell? Then he turns. He moves, I told you, he moves from the simple to the more complex. Then he turns, starting at line 40, or 61, and he asks the bird to teach him something. Teach us, sprite or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine. I've never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. See, it's fascinating to think about. You flip on your iPod to any kind of music. But think about this. That music was all created. Somebody had to make it up. Somebody had to invent it, and then create it, and then play it, upload it, so you could download it. All that stuff had to be done by people, <laughs> correct? All that stuff had to be done, correct? But a bird song, like, where, okay, all those people I just said to construct a, a, a tune on iTunes for you, right, on your iPod, what about a bird? Where does it come from? What makes the bird sing the way it sings, and why? Why would it sing in the morning time, for example? What's the point? This is what he asks for, right? Notice, what objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind? What ignorance of pain? In other words, normally if you hear someone singing really loud, you don't assume about them that they're sad or they're in pain. He says about the bird, the bird seems to never be in pain. It only seems to always be happy. How do you account for that? With thy clear, keen joyance, languor cannot be. Shadow of annoyance never came near thee. Thou lovest, it's an interesting line at line 80. Thou lovest, but never knew love's sad satiety. In other words, birds never sing about breaking up. They, they, they sing about love but they don't sing about losing love. That's his assumption. Humans know love, but we also know the loss of love. And that makes us very sad. He says it seems like birds don't have to experience that, and so their song is more joyful, more pure. Keep going. Waking or asleep, thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream, or how could thy notes flow in such a crystalline stream? And then, of course, these are the lines most quoted. We can debate them at 3B. We look behind and uh, we look before and after and pine for what is not. What does the word pine mean there? It's, it's our word whine. It's our word whine or to be sad. We pine or we're sad for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Now that is an interesting idea. So you, for example, start dying laughing at something or someone. Like really laughing, like so hard laughing, you're ready to fall off your chair or whatever. That kind of laughing. Shelley says, are you ready for this? Shelley says, when you are really laughing hard, that's because you're really sad. See, Judice just gave me that look because it's like a total paradox. Go back and look at it again. Now that I've, now that I've said that, Judice, go back and look at these lines again. We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. In other words, filled. In other words, you've got some pain 
which is why you're laughing so hard. Then the final line of the stanza, our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Mm -hmm. Pick your favorite song and write it down right now on the paper in front of you. If you can't do this, then pick a song you like. But if you have a favorite song, that is to say, you can only listen to one more song before you die. What would that one song be of your entire playlist of iPod? If I were to tell you, you could only listen to one more song before you leave, what would that one song be? Write the title down real quickly. And by the way, for those of you that say, I've never thought about that question, Shelley says, now's the time. Let a bird's song make you think about that question. But about the title you just wrote down, ask yourself, did you write the title down because it makes you really happy or because it makes you really sad? And Shelley says the answer will be yes. Shelley says the answer to that question, did I write the title down because it makes me really happy or really sad? Shelley says the answer to that question is yes. Yes. No, no, you don't understand. I'm asking, does the song make me really happy or does it make me really sad? And Shelley says, right. That's right. That's right. Because here's why. In the moment of enjoying your favorite song, Shelley says there's some kind of trace or hint of sadness. Either it reminds you of something in the past that you no longer have, or it reminds you that there will come a point in your future when you're dead and you can't hear the song anymore. It's over. Either way, he says, when you're laughing really hard, that's because you're sad about something. Unlike a bird, that simply sings because it's nothing but happy. Birds, unlike humans, don't have to worry about being sad. Or as we said it before, the difference between you and a fly is you know about fly swatters. See, flies don't know about fly swatters. They're just flies. Humans know about the fly swatter. And in, so, in that moment, in that realization, we can be kind of sad about the fact that no matter what it is we love, we know sooner or later it's going to go away. It's the essence of, of existence, Mr. Nelson. And that brings us back to the question of innocence. Is it better to be innocent right. or experienced? Right, that's right. Which is better, in, for example, this poem, which is better, to sing the song of a bird who just sings but has no sense of sadness, or is it better to be human? We love deeper because we know that the fly swatter is coming, right? We're aware of it. Yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, by the way, those are the big three that he says keep us from being able to enjoy our life. If we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we should ever come near. If we were creatures of complete joy, we could never sing a better, more joyful song than the song of this bird. In our last now minutes remaining, I want to go back to page 858. I want to look now at question 10 one more time, and I want to help you outline this paper, all right? So now to the blank sheet of paper that some of you maybe did pull out at the beginning. I'm going to amplify this question to make it a little easier for you, all right, Mr. Judice? So I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this a little bit easier for you. Instead of simply writing, Mr. Rothlutner, on this line from In Defense of Poetry, I'm going to allow you, Mr. Nelson, to comment on any part of Defense of Poetry. So you don't have to just focus on this one line. You can focus on any of the ideas presented in Defense of Poetry that we read on page 857. Okay? That makes it a little bit easier. And what you'll do is ask this simple question. For each one of the three poems of Shelley's that we have, Ozymandias, Ode to the West Wind,